uh, to welcome His Ex Excellency Arkady Jagowski, Ambassador of the Republic of Poland in the United Kingdom, and the participants and guests of the conference Poland Restores the Born and Regain 100 Years On. <coughs> I am Diane Hopper, uh, the Director of UCL School of Islamic Eastern and Studies. And I just want to make a, a brief announcement about uh, arrangements. The toilets are one story up by the stairs. Uh, and the uh, emergency exits, as you see, are marked. Uh, and if you hear a fire alarm, it's the real thing. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, <coughs> uh, as the relatively new director of the School of Islamic History of Studies, I'd like to say a few more words about the school, because I'd like you to know what a remarkably unique institution is hosting this conference today. Uh, UCLC is one of the world's leading specialist institutions in the largest center in the UK for the multidisciplinary study of Central Eastern Southeastern Europe and Russia. CIS was founded in 1915 by Thomas Harry Masaryk, uh, later elected first president of Czechoslovakia. In 1999, CIS merged with UCL, and in 2004, it moved to its own purpose built and prize money building, where you will be uh, treated to a lunch on the fourth floor. Uh, the CIS Library, with close to 400,000 items, is one of the largest in the world devoted to East European studies and you'll be able to see the library through the atrium as you make your way to lunch. CIS is currently educating almost 1,000 students. About 700 of these are undergraduates, pursuing degrees in uh, a different number of program areas, including economics and business, politics and sociology, history, and literature and culture. At the postgraduate level, we offer both teaching and research masters, including the International Masters in Economy, State, and Society, a double degree program with a consortium of European universities, including the Yadalonian University in Kabul. Currently, about 60 PhD students are pursuing their studies here. CIS is home to perhaps the largest concentration of academic staff devoted to the study of the region, with almost 60 academics whose fields include history, business, and economics, politics, sociology, literature, and culture, and the teaching of foreign languages. We have the capacity to teach 18 languages of the region. Uh, and we employ 27 full-time or part-time language teachers on our staff. Today's event, this conference on uh, 100 years of Polish independence, represents the kind of intellectual engagement we prize at CIS. Like all of our events, it reflects the initiative of our own staff. Uh, and I want to salute the leadership of Professor Richard butterwick Pawlikowski uh, for spearheading its organization. This is the great season of centenaries. On Sunday, the bells of Britain will toll to mark 100 years of the signing of the peace to end the war, to end all wars. Uh, this is a fitting and important acknowledgement of 100 years uh, since one of the most global moments uh, of the modern age, the year 1918. No place better symbolizes and represents this global moment of 1918 than the Republic of Poland, which in that year gained its independence and opportunity, opportunity to establish its political legitimacy and cultural independence. Poland was a crossroads of Europe and endured the experience of being a colony simultaneously of three different landlocked empires. Its reemergence as an independent state offers not only a success story for national aspirations, but its birth in 1918 provides historians with a rich laboratory for the study of political legitimacy, ethnic relations, religious pluralism and conflict, and ideological contest. We have yet to learn whether 2018 or 2019 will be another global moment, a decisive rearrangement of the borders of the United Kingdom and of Europe. We cannot ignore the tensions between the importance of state sovereignty and the need for collective security and international cooperation. If 1918 was a time of great national hope uh, as well as danger, 2018 seems to be weighted more on the danger side. Europe is changing. But whatever the outcome of Brexit, the work of communication and collaboration represented by this conference will guarantee that open intellectual borders will remain the hallmark of our roles in the academy, the world of scholarly inquiry, and in the realm of public affairs. <coughs> we celebrate today the confluence of the global moment of 1918 with Poland's own national moment. So I wish you a very productive and stimulating conference. And now it's my privilege to introduce to you His Excellency Arkady Jagotsky, the Ambassador of the Republic of Poland in the United Kingdom. So I am uh, Kulka, Professor Dr. Uh, Pawlikowski, all the senior professors, 
consume of gas, let's send it to them. It gives me great joy to be with you today to open this conference, which is one of the events which, along with many others, form the part of worldwide celebration of the centenary of Poland regaining its independence. On this note, please accept Professor Ben Conker, a uh, book on history and culture, on British history and culture, which has prepared such a, such a book, um, which is a, um, a gift for the Seas Library. Uh, this is a part of Polish Bookshelf uh, project, a project established by the embassy to commemorate the century of Poland regaining independence and 250 years of UK-Polish uh, diplomatic relations. May these books provide insight for reading to all who come to use your wonderful library. I'm also most honored to invite you to the exhibition organized by Dr. Katarzyna Zahenter of CIS titled The Polish Fight for Independence 1914-1918, featuring personal artifacts connected to two families that fought for Poland's independence during World War I in the Polish legions, but also earlier during the January uprising, 1863. Both these conferences and this uh, exhibition take us through the long journey of Polish independence which was more than a dream and aspiration for our forefathers. In fact, this century, this 2018, is a crucial not only for Poland, but also for all Central Europe. And I think that we'll remember about that. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to open this conference and to extend my words of gratitude to the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies for your kind hospitality in hosting this historical conference and exhibition. Very special thanks to Professor Richard Butterwick Pawlikowski and uh, Claudia Roland for all their tremendous work in organizing this conference. Thank you to all the academics who have traveled from near and far to share with us their research. Especially this, I, I would like to underline that this, your work is especially important nowadays because still there is not enough knowledge about Central Europe and about Poland in the United Kingdom and in other countries, which is, in my perspective, the biggest barrier to have a closer cooperation between our countries. So thank you very much for your, for your hard work. I wish you most fruitful and uh, stimulating discussion. Thank you. Your Excellency, Madam Director, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Ambassador, Professor Arkady Zhegovsky, for those important words, and to thank the Embassy for its very generous support of this conference, uh, without which it could not possibly have been put on. Uh, we particularly appreciate, too, how much work Dr. Clarinda Karma has put in to ensure that this conference would happen. And we also thank you for the generous gift of books regarding Polish history uh, for the CIS Library. I'd like to thank Professor Diane Kernke for her unstinting support uh, of this significant event and those warm words of welcome. I'd also like to express my gratitude to my par academic partner uh, in putting the conference together, Dr. Thomas Lorman, and my special thanks to Claudia Rowland, who has been the logistic mastermind and spiritus movens. And my own presence here has been made possible by the support of the College of Europe at Natalin. Warm thanks, too, for all of our speakers and chairpersons for accepting the invitation to participate in this conference. We have a lineup of some of the finest historians of Poland and Central Europe currently working in Poland, Great Britain, and the USA. At this point, I should say that Professor Andrzej Novak does hope to join us. Unfortunately, because of the strike, his flight was cancelled last night, but he's been rebooked onto one this morning. Uh, so he will be here, we hope, but in the second panel rather than the first. And I'd like to thank Professor Thomas Schramm to agree, for agreeing to uh, move to the, uh, to the first panel instead. 
as the ambassador has said, there is a fascinating exhibition uh, in the foyer of SIS organized by uh, Dr. Katarzyna Zahenta, who I hope will be able to join us uh, uh, later. Uh, and finally, last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming today. The many people gathered here in this state-of-the-art lecture theatre hold very different convictions about the past, present, and future. We cannot ignore, at this national, European, and global moment, how very divided, polarized, and riven are the Polish, British, and American nations. We can no longer assume that it is normal to discuss the problems of pursuing the common good within shared human values. Institutions, communities, families, and friends have been riven by the demagogue's claims that whoever is not with us is against us, whoever thinks differently from us serves the enemy, therefore they must be barbarians or fanatics or criminals or traitors. Politicians and journalists routinely sling historical terms such as Targovica as a cheap insult. Historians are not immune from such pressures, especially when the politics of history and memory are ideological fault lines. Polish historians and historians of Poland, the two are not the same, although there is an overlap, are about as politically divided as any other professional group. They have, however, repeatedly shown themselves capable of calm and reasoned debate over emotive questions of the recent and not so recent past. Historians' professional ethic obliges them to weigh up evidence carefully and to subject narratives to skeptical criticism. It is impossible, however much some of us li like to, to lock the past in the past. The answer to the political manipulation of history from whichever quarter that might come is not less history, but better history. We can, I expect, look forward to some very lively polemics and some profound disagreements in our discussions today. But I also trust that both among our invited speakers and among every member of the audience, that all arguments will be made ad rem and never ad personam. The subtitle of the conference is 100 Years On. Not all that long ago, only just beyond the limits of adult memory, a very few people can still remember those events of 1918 from their childhood. Many more can remember the reminiscences of their parents or grandparents. 123 years passed between the third partition of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth a polity that was generally known as Poland, and the founding of the Second Republic of Poland. That wasn't so long either. Only four or five generations. The veterans of the January 1863 uprising against the Russian Empire were honored in interwar Poland. They could remember veterans of the Kosciuszko uprising of 1794. Poland did not have to be reinvented after a hiatus of several centuries. Its language assembled and codified from folklore, or its claims to a tradition of statehood subjected to the tendentious interpretation of medieval chronicles. Between the dismemberment of the Polish state and its restoration, Poland was an unbroken thread in thousands of families of varying status, including the Zahentas, bound together, above all, by culture. To state that Poland was a completely new entity after the Great War is to override the consciousness of millions of people who considered themselves Polish. That does not mean that the Poles of 100 years ago were not divided by their experiences, assumptions, and convictions. Of course they were. The institutional, economic, and cultural challenges of harmonizing the legacies of three imperial systems within the borders of a single Polish state were immense. As we shall hear, they were faced by the army, the Roman Catholic Church, and even literati. 
Nor does it mean that the politics and governance of the interbellum state were much like those of the old Commonwealth. They were not. Józef Piłsudski and Roman Domowski disagreed on most things, but they concurred that the Commonwealth had fallen because of the fatal Polish disease, anarchy. The answer, they believed, was discipline, even at the expense of political and civil freedoms. Only in recent decades has the Polish Republican tradition been rehabilitated. Profound social, economic, cultural and intellectual transformations took place during the long 19th century. And this meant that the Polish national community was constantly being reimagined, although not imagined from scratch. The Polish work of nation building competed with other national projects of the partitioning empires and those of other national communities who also aspired to their own nation states. Woodrow Wilson's re morally resonant ideal of national self-determination collided with uncomfortable realities. The national territories claimed often overlapped, even when, as between Poland and Czechoslovakia, mountains provided most of the frontier. Older multiple identities fractured, sometimes prompting brothers to choose different nations. Nowhere were these pressures more complex than in the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which had become the western provinces of the Russian Empire. These pressures bred rivalries and fed prejudices, which in some circumstances could turn violent. It is fitting that we shall hear about the various meanings of Polish independence for Jews. The trajectory on which the old Commonwealth was heading, that of parliamentary monarchy and evolutionary social reform, signposted by the Constitution of the 3rd of May 1791, was rudely interrupted. Today's conference is rightly a stage for eminent historians of the early 20th century, but perhaps this dissuitiamist may be forgiven for recalling the interrupted tradition of the 3rd of May, Poland's other national holiday. Many less, for, uh, for evolutionary reform to flourish, independence and sovereignty are preconditions. Many lessons could be learned from the partitions of Poland in the 18th century and again in 1939, but this one surely is fundamental. The full enjoyment of liberty, political and civil, positive and negative, republican and liberal, depends on independence. 19th century Poles responded in different ways to the challenges of being divided among three monarchies. These responses are usually given as loyalism, the acceptance of foreign rule and the consequent loss of nationhood. Emigration, <coughs> resistance, not necessarily armed but always involving sacrifice. And the most complex and difficult of all, organic work. This can be described as looking after the physical and moral condition of the nation while seeking a tolerable political compromise, pending the chance to regain independence. Such was the path pursued by many Wielkopolania, greater Poles under Prussian rule. In the winter of 1918 to 19, they chose their moment well. Their rising, the Powstania Wielkopolskie, was so successful that it seems un-Polish. <laughs> Today we shall hear about the greater Polish path to independence. Now all of these four traditions, loyalism, emigration, resistance and organic work, were reprised during the tragic half century that began in 1939, and I would argue three of them proved useful, not loyalism. Poland restored, reborn, regained. Each of these terms has a, pos uh, has a different emotional impact. Restored. That conveys a sense of what is right and legitimate. But it might just suggest that Poland was restored principally by others. Reborn. Now that is a visceral, corporeal, gendered, religious metaphor. Born again, or perhaps resurrected from the dead. Regained something cherished that has been lost or stolen but now that precious gift is ours again and not without a struggle 
Ladies and gentlemen, I've spoken too long and it is time to begin. And so I invite Anne White, the Professor of Polish Studies at UCLC, to chair the first panel. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first panel. The first panel is called Centennial Reflections on Polish Independence and Statehood. Um, as you've heard, um, Professor Novak is not able to be with us yet, so Professor Schramm has very kindly agreed to be the third speaker in this panel. We're going to start off with Professor Polonsky. I, su I suggest that you each speak for 20 minutes, and then we have the discussion at the end. Well, my... The, next, the title of my paper is Polish Statehood and the Jews, Reflections on the Centenary of Polish Independence. Uh, obviously, it would have been better if Professor Novak had gone first, but my paper would follow on from his. I'd also like to endorse the first remarks that Richard Butterick made today. I think that history is a very important subject, and what we need is more and better history rather than politicized and uh, partial history. The re-emergence of the Polish state after 130 years of foreign rule was the most obvious example of the triumph of the principle of nationality in the post-First World War settlement. The new state, with a population of nearly 30 million, was the largest and most powerful in East Central Europe, and the feeling was widespread that the shedding of foreign rule would make it possible quickly to dispel Polish backwardness and would soon enable Poland to take her place as a highly developed European country. What I want to do today is to reflect on the conditions which made possible the emergence of this state and what effect it had on the Jewish community in the Polish lands, by now, after that, in the United States, the largest in the world. Poland's independence and the final consolidation of its frontiers with the Treaty of Riga in March 1921 was the result of the interaction of two developments. The first was the bankruptcy in the Polish lands of the previously dominant ideology of positivism and the emergence of new political forces more interested in the pursuit of the goal of independence. And the second was the collapse of the three empires which had partitioned the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the end of the 18th century. This, I think, is the subject of Professor Biskupski's presentation also in this panel. The undermining of the position of the Polish integrationists, the positivists, exponents on Polish soil of a variant of Western liberalism and of the Jews who were associated with them was the result of a number of developments. In the first place, their desire to avoid conflict with the partitioning powers and to avoid outright pursuit of independence for a long period came to seem increasingly uh, humiliating as uh, the partitioning powers failed to answer what the Poles needed. In secondly, acculturation and assimilation, this is of the Jews, are relatively slow processes, and their impact on the relatively stable Jewish society of the Kingdom of Poland was limited. In addition, the Poles did not control the educational system of the Kingdom of Poland, and the Russian authorities were not really interested in fostering Polish education. As a result, the ambition of the positivists to create a less prejudiced and religiously divided society through a modern and secular educational system proved illusory. I agree with Richard here that I don't think this is organic work, but this is liberalism in its Western style, and it's something which we have very much need of in Poland today. At the same time, the Polish middle class which the positivists had seen as the principal supporters of liberal ideas, began to develop, but first in Prussian Poland, this I hope is what Professor Schramm will be talking about, and then in Galicia and in the Kingdom of Poland, became increasingly sympathetic to nationalist ideas. There was also a growing disillusionment with the consequences of capitalism and the market economy, which the positivists had seen as agents which would make possible the emergence of a modern and properly balanced Polish society. As a result, the period between 1890 and 1914 witnessed a fundamental transformation of Polish political life, especially in Russian Poland, which throughout the 19th century remained the principal focus of Polish politics. The movement which did most to undermine the positive position was integral nationalism, a force which emerged 
in many other European countries at this time. In the national movement which Domofsky and his associates were attempting to create, as was the case in most such movements, the external and internal other perceived as the enemy constituted a key factor in creating a sense of identity and unity. For the National Democrats, the principal external enemy was Prussia stroke Germany. Increasingly, however, the Jews, the internal enemy, came to be the main focus of Endek hostility. The National Democrats were, folk were challenged from the left by socialism in both its national and revolutionary variants. The principal spokesman of those who advocated, uh, who tried to combine socialism with the Polish national idea was of course Józef Pilsudski, who advocated a new national insurrection in alliance with the emerging national movements in Lithuania, Belarus and Ukraine. With the decline of the positivists, these years also saw a challenge within the Jewish community to the previously dominant <coughs> position of the integrationists. Movements appeared, both nationalist and socialist in ideology, which took their inspiration from the new Jewish politics, with its stress on Jewish peoplehood and its rejections of a rejection of the illusions and shameful compromises of assimilation, as they described it. The emergence of this new Jewish politics contributed to the growing loss of faith in Jewish integration within the Polish elite. The increased strength of Zionism in the Kingdom of Poland was taken by much of Polish society as a rejection of a bona fide offer of integration. The integrationist view of the future, the belief that the Jews could and should be transformed into Poles of the Jewish faith, <coughs> lost much of its attractiveness, both among Poles and Jews, insofar as these are discrete categories, which of course was not always the case. When the great powers of Europe put their alliance systems to the test in 1914, they unwittingly submitted to the arbitrament of war questions which had long lain dormant. Among them, of course, was the Polish question. The failure of either side to secure a quick victory and the stabilization of the front in France after the first battle of the Marne meant that the struggle would be a long one. In this situation, the powers which had partitioned Poland now sought to enlist Polish support in the conflict. In August 1914, the Russian commander-in-chief, the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, issued a manifesto declaring that it was Russian policy to join Poland together as a state within the Russian system. This proposal fell far short of independence, which remained the ultimate aspiration of most Poles, but was supported by the National Democrats. In November of that year, Roman Domowski founded the Polish National Committee in Warsaw in order to promote the cause of Poland in association with Russia. In spite of their reservations about Tsarist Russia, the Jews supported the Russian war effort in large numbers. Over 500,000 Jews served in the Russian army. This did not allay Russian hostility. The Russian government did not modify its anti-Jewish policies in spite of strong pressures from the Western powers, and the Russian high command did not hesitate to blame its initial defeats on the Jews who were also denounced in the national democratic press for spying. Indeed, the outbreak of the war did not bring to an end the Polish-Jewish tension which had been such a feature of life in the Kingdom of Poland before 1914. In an attempt to allay suspicion that they were pro-German, a number of leading Jewish figures in Warsaw issued a declaration welcoming the Grand Duke Nikolai's manifesto and affirming that, quote, together with the entire country, the Jewish community awaits the dawn of, new life, of the new life which is begun for Poland. This merely provoked the National Democratic Gazeta Porana to respond. Is it not clear that the consolidation and economic independence of the Polish group, its independence from the Jews, will be one of the main elements of the reunified Poland's a program of action? The Austro-Hungarians, for their part, sought to incorporate the Kingdom of Poland into the Habsburg Empire and to unite it with Galicia as a third constituent part of the monarchy. This had some support among local Poles. In August 1914, the Polish club in the Austrian parliament set up the Naczelny Komitet Narodowy in Kraków, which declared its support for a victorious war to liberate Poland from the domination of the Tsar and place it under Habsburg rule. In addition, Józef Piłsudski's plans for an invasion of the Kingdom of Poland received approval from the Austrian military authorities. 
This initiative, of course, as we all know, failed. As the Poles in Kielce, the first town the soldiers entered, were clearly hostile and demonstrated their support for the Tsarist government. The situation changed with the successful German and Austrian offensives in the spring and summer of 1915. Two, German, two occupation regimes were established in the former Kingdom of Poland, a larger German sector and a smaller Austrian sector. At the same time, the, German, the, the Germans were now, of course, the dominant power in the area. Hard pressed by the Allied blockade, they pursued a policy of systematic economic exaction in their zone, removing not only raw materials, but also machinery and industrial apparatus. At the same time, their administration did make some concessions to Polish national sentiment. In November 1916, they established a Kingdom of Poland with, quote, a hereditary monarchy and constitutional institutions. The new state was to be allied with the central powers and its frontiers were left for subsequent settlement. The army which it established was initially supported by Pilsudski, but he eventually rejected the limited independence offered and in the summer of 1917, as we all know, was interned by the Germans in Magdeburg. Given the way that they had been treated both by the Tsarist government and by the pro-Russian camp in the Kingdom of Poland, it's not surprising that the Jews enthusiastically welcomed the Russian defeats in the spring of 1915 and that people of Jewish origin constituted a significant proportion of the officers and soldiers of the Polish legion set up by Pilsudski to fight alongside the Austrians. The establishment of German rule in former Russian Poland led to a significant improvement in Polish-Jewish relations. The groups which supported the central powers had been at odds with the National Democrats before the war and were, by and large, less hostile to the Jews and less willing to indulge in anti-Jewish demagogy. The Germans, for their part, were now in a position to undertake major policy initiatives in relation to all the peoples of the area to the east of the Reich, including the Jews. After their victories, they made grandiose plans for the reorganization of Europe and were eager to find an appropriate place for Jews in these schemes. Yet it should be stressed that these utopian plans had little following among Polish Jews and that the German authorities too did not have a consistent and clearly thought out plan for the Jews of Poland. At the same time, the German rule, German rule did see a major revival of uh, Jewish political life. I have to com summarize very drastically these very interesting and complicated problems. Maybe we'll come back to them in discussion. The slowness of Russia to take action in making concessions on Polish autonomy caused increasing disillusionment among the pro-Russian Poles. And in November 1915, Domovsky thus moved to Western Europe. His view was that only pressure from France and Britain would induce Russia to change her policy. The Russian Revolution of March 1917 did cause a major change in the situation. The Russian provisional government now issued a manifesto promising to set up an independent Polish state composed of all the ethnically Polish territories linked with Russia in a free military union. But of course this hope was destroyed by the Bolshevik Revolution of November 1917, which led to the outbreak of a brutal four-way civil war. In this, the Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, sought to retain power and were challenged by the whites, seeking to restore Tsarist rule. Various national groups, including the Poles, Ukrainians, Balts, and the nations of the Caucasus, aiming at national independence, and peasant anarchists seeking to rule themselves. The main focus of the civil war was Ukraine, and Jews here suffered particularly, being targeted by all groups, including the Bolsheviks, who were, however, different from the others in that their commanders punished those who engaged in anti-Jewish violence. The number of Jewish casualties in the civil war, which <coughs> saw much larger casualties, about 8 million, was, uh, is the most reliable figure is around 100,000, with many more wounded. Violence against women also occurred on a large scale. The extensive Jewish losses affected the Jewish community both culturally and economically for decades after the tragedy. One major consequence was that the Jews of the former Tsarist Empire came increasingly to side with the Bolsheviks, the only force willing to oppose the pogrom wave. The fate of Poland, of course, now came to depend on the Western powers. Lloyd George gave his support to Polish independence in the 14 points, and on the 11th of November, the German forces were disarmed without struggle. 
Pilsudski returned to Poland and was able there to reach agreement with Ignacy Paderewski and set up a government which included the National Democrats. This agreement masked the deep divisions between the two sides, the Domowskiites and the Pilsudskiites. They were divided above all on what should be done with the areas to the east of the Polish ethnic core. The National Democrats wanted a national state. They favoured extending the borders of Poland eastwards into the areas where the Polish national element constituted an important part of the population and where the peasantry could be Polonized. Pilsudski wanted rather to establish independent Lithuanian, Belarusian and Ukrainian states which would be federated with Poland. This federalist concept certainly accorded with his dictum that Poland will be a great power or she will not exist. It can be questioned whether Poland had the resources to undertake this policy and whether it took into account sufficiently the desire for national independence in Lithuania and Ukraine. What it did lead was to a Polish the Soviet war and it may be that this was also caused here, Professor Novak would be very helpful, by the Bolsheviks' own aspirations in Western Europe. The clash unquestionably led to enormous damage to inter-ethnic relations in the mixed areas east of the Polish ethnic heartland, where Pilsudski's respect for the national identity of others was not shared by many local Poles. These years were difficult ones for the Jews of Poland. The struggle to establish Poland's frontiers had extremely deleterious effects on their position. The, Poles found that the new state found the burden of establishing and maintaining a large army a heavy one, and the forced levies of, uh, and contributions that this, which this made possible fell heavily on the largely urban Jewish population. The Poles showed little understanding for the Jews, desire of the Jews in ethnically mixed areas such as Galicia or Lithuania to maintain a neutral position, and at the same time the fact that the Jews constituted a significant proportion of the communist leadership both in Russia and Poland led to the belief that Jews and communists were identical. Under these circumstances, these years were marked by a series of anti-Jewish outrages which were on a smaller scale than those in Ukraine, but in which three, between 350 and 500 Jews lost their lives. This was seen by the Western powers as a major problem, and it led to the introduction of uh, a set of, regula of national minority treaties which uh, the Poles were, among others, forced to accept. The limitation of these treaties was quickly apparent. In Poland, it was bitterly resented, in part because the uh, uh, great powers in Germany were not subject to such treaties. The Jews were violently attacked as its in main integrators. The Jewish, opi Jewish opinion was divided on the treaty, which was attacked as too provocative by the assimilationists and to a lesser extent by the Orthodox and by some Jewish economic organizations. More serious were the limitations on the role of the League as the minority treaties <coughs> enforcement mechanism. Again, I could say much more on this problem but time is short. Poland had now achieved its independence after 130 years of foreign rule. The euphoria which masked, if only briefly, the extent of the divisions which were to mark, uh, the, the euphoria which uh, uh, then took place masked, if only briefly, the extent of the divisions which were to mar Poland's political life in the interwar years. According to Premier Jędrzej Moraczewski, it was, I quote, impossible to describe the exhilaration, craziness, and euphoria of the Polish people in 1918. For the Jews, the experience of the war with its shifting fronts and anti-Jewish violence had been traumatic. However, the post-war situation did have some positive elements for them. Zionism now inter enjoyed international recognition, as did the national rights of the Jews in the states of Poland and Lithuania, and the autonomy which they had been granted in Lithuania and also in Ukraine. The democratic constitutions established in both these countries led to the hope that Jews would be equal citizens. In addition, the Soviet regime was not yet as totalitarian and repressive as it was later to become, and it gave some hope that it would establish both security and equality for its Jewish population and a new form of socialist autonomy. Indeed, in spite of the catastrophes which had occurred, the mood within the Jewish world, and particularly in the American Jewish community, now the most significant in the world, in the immediate post-war period was almost euphoric. In a speech at Carnegie Hall on 28 July 1919, Louis Marshall, one of the main architects of the National Minorities Treaty, described what had been achieved in ecstatic terms. I quote, You, my friends, are celebrating an event which the Almighty in his wisdom willed. It is, however, but natural that we of the House of Israel should unite in joyful thanksgiving. For the first time, the nations of the world have recognized 
that in common with all other peoples we are entitled to equality in law. It has now become an established principle that any violation of the rights of a minority is an offence not only against the individuals but against the law which controls all of the civilised nations of the earth. He went on to assure the leaders of the new Poland that the Jews would, appropriate, would respond appropriately to the situation in which they found themselves. I am confident that I speak for every Jew when I say that henceforth the Jews of Poland will vie with their fellow citizens in an effort to establish but one standard of civilization and to cultivate friendships and brotherhood. Let us forget the nightmare of the past. Let us be swallowed up by the brilliancy and glory of the dawning of a new day. I won't comment on what happened to these prophecies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Butterworth Pawlikowski for telling me that I may speak for three and one half hours, uh, which would certainly give me more time than uh, Professor Polonsky <laughs> had. Uh, my remarks are uh, relatively brief, and I'd like to bring us all to the fact that uh, let's assume that it's November 11th, 1918. The war has just ended, and perhaps parenthetically, we should keep in mind. Uh, that Polish casualties in World War I, proportionate to the American, are 40 times uh, larger. Uh, the, uh, the, I'll pick, make this closer. Uh, to prevent such a grotesque event as the war happening again, two possible solutions emerge. The traditional geopolitical or balance of power solution, or Wilsonian idealism. The latter is easily assembled by studying a few documents, all well known, his Peace Without Victory speech of 1917, the 14 points of the next year, the conclusions of the American advisor, committee the so-called inquiry, and a few others. What Europe would those guidelines have given us? Wilsonianism, a revolutionary conception of international affairs, begins with the rejection of history and geopolitics, and especially the balance of power calculations. It is based upon democracy, self-determination, free trade, disarmament, and the so-called rule of law. Wilson's wartime pronouncements regarding Poland are few. His Peace Without Victory speech called for, and I'm quoting him, a united, autonomous, and independent Poland, unquote. It provided Polish independence with support from a major and non-belligerent power. As, the, as a result, the Poles realized that Wilson played a major role in putting the so-called Polish question on the diplomatic agenda of the war and were understandably pleased. However, Wilson's endorsement did not indicate that he had any real plan in mind for Poland, or indeed what and where Poland was. Indeed, shortly after delivering his speech, he told the uh, British government that perhaps a good solution to Poland's difficulties would be, for it to, for to, would, would be to place it under Russian guarantee. In 1918, he presented a rather detailed vision of Poland as the 13th of the 14 points. We must remember the oft-overlooked context of the speech, however. Before Wilson spoke, Germany and Austria had already, quite cynically of course, announced on November 6, 1916, that an independent Poland already existed and that the partitions were no longer in force. Great Britain and France had declared an independent Poland as a war aim as early as January 10, 1917. Even Russia had offered grudging approval. The Entente powers acted to please Wilson, who was already known for his vague support of the idea of an independent Poland. Nonetheless, the speech was of historic importance, even though there was no evidence that Wilson then, or later, included Poland into a geostrategic understanding of the war. The 13th point reads, and I am quoting, an independent Poland an independent, excuse me, an independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured of free and secure access to the sea, and whose political and economic independence and territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international guarantee. Uh, many Poles were not happy uh, with the speech, and they should not have been. Why does he use the word should and not must, as he does in reference to other countries like Belgium? Should is not a demand, but merely a good idea. Paldorescu was later told that since must would be an ultimatum, Wilson had not used it. Is this a war aim, therefore, or a moral endorsement? Already Wilson's support of Polish independence is problematical. Second and far more important, many Poles in 1795 assumed that, assumed that Poland would be restored, not erected. 
Though precise borders were controversial, the use of the term erected is not only offensive to, to Polish amour propre, but Wilson's non-historical Poland was an entirely new idea which separated Poland from its own history. If history was not uh, the guideline for Poland, what was? By using this term, Wilson indicated that Poland would be the work of Western powers, well, really Wilson. Uh, Wilson's Poland was to be ethnographic. It was to include only people of indisputably uh, uh, Polish nationality, but that really means nothing. For example, if in a village of, say, 1,000 people there was a single Lithuanian, does that make the territory disputable and hence denied to Poland? What indeed is an indisputable Pole, or for that matter, an indisputable American? Why are the Poles burdened with this virtually impossible task to prove? Why does Wilson never insist that neither Russia nor Germany include only ethnically indisputable populations? If you do not also simultaneously create a Ukraine or a Belarus or Baltic states, ideas Wilson opposed, and Poland included only ethnic Poles and no minorities, much of this vast territory goes inevitably to the Russians. Therefore, creating an ethnographic Poland results in a huge non-ethnographic Russia. Closely related is Wilson's insistence on self-determination, a dangerously vague idea. Can you endorse self-determination and simultaneously deny Ukrainians the right to have it? Even Wilson admitted later that when he insisted on this principle, and I'm quoting Wilson, he did so in ignorance of the very existence of, of some of the nationalities of Eastern Europe. Wilson does not seem to have realized the consequences of his remarks on the political geography of Europe. Poland is to have, as we know, access to the sea, says the 13th point. But where? When Roman Domowski asked Wilson if he meant that Poland will receive the only major Baltic port, Danzig, Polsdańsk, Wilson bizarrely answered unhesitatingly, no. But when an astonished Mowski pressed Wilson, if not Danzig, then where and how will Poland have secure access to the sea? Wilson had no answers whatsoever. Desperate Wilson promised that the future League of Nations would somehow solve the problem entirely. In a little known conversation between Wilson and the American diplomat James Girard, Wilson fantastically stated that Poland would receive no coastal territory whatsoever. Wilson's closest advisor, Colonel House, and the Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, argue that Poland must have Danzig. Wilson ignored them both. Wilson's Poland thus really had no free and secure access to the sea, according to Wilson. He proclaimed the ideal, but had no idea what it entailed. Uh, when Wilson, uh, Wilson's unwillingness to discuss the issue caused Berlin to conclude that Poland would not receive any coastal territory from Germany whatsoever. Wilson's Poland is, at best, problematical. But when we place the issue in the geopolitical framework of Europe, the dimensions of what Wilson had done takes on much greater significance. The 14th point, which introduced us to the League of Nations, really explains everything. Poland's existence will be, uh, will be dependent upon the existence of the League. Hence, if the League stumbles or fails, Poland is doomed. The concept of Poland uh, was a contingency to a larger vision. A Wilsonian Poland can only exist in a Wilsonian world. This world, he insisted, represented a moral revolution. War was end, wars would end, alliances would be unnecessary, disarmament could be instituted. Geopolitical concerns are consigned to the historic scrap heap. Strikingly, in a 1919 conversation in Indianapolis, Indiana, Wilson lightheartedly observed that the Poland which emerged from the war was incapable of assuring its own independence, and he had already known it before he spoke. Wilson, perhaps uh, unconsciously, had placed Poland in a dreadful geopolitical position. Wilson's utter disregard for basic geopolitical calculation is obvious when we contextualize point 13 with point 6 regarding Russia. There, Wilson celebrated the reconstruction of what would be a new Russian empire. He insisted that, and I'm quoting, all Russian territory, historically and not ethnographically defined, must be evacuated but never defined what this territory was. All powers were to, and again I'm quoting, give Russia, give Russia assistance of every kind, and it will be Russia and not any other power who will determine the type and dimension of what so-called Russian needs are and to be given special attention. Wilson's insistence that Poland be ethnographic reflected his concern for the rights of minorities, but he does not apply the same principle to the Russians. 
The governor, a government of Russia was historically a little short of tyrannical. This, of course, we all know. A multinational, eventually perhaps communist Russia, contradicts the Wilsonian basics demanding self-determination. The Ukrainians, for example, do not exist. Russia is to be determined by Russia, and no guidelines whatsoever are to be followed. This reflects the conclusions of his wartime advisory body, the so-called Inquiry. The Inquiry rather cavalierly rejected both independence for Ukraine and Belarus uh, and their alliance uh, with Poland. When the only trained expert on the question, Robert Howard Lord, raised the idea of an Eastern European Federation, he was contemptu uh, contemptuously dismissed by Wilson. Lord had rejected an ethnographic Poland and hence was ignored by Wilson as well. Lord argued that the statistical information guiding the inquiry, the 1897 Russian census was, and I'm quoting with Lord, desperately false and simply fantastic. Clearly pre-designed to undermine Polish territorial claims, if followed, it would create borders which were, again I'm quoting Lord, fantastic and quite impossible. But Lord knew uh, that Polish alliances with Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania would be opposed by Wilson because he would regard them as, quote, weakening Russia. Questions regarding Poland's eastern frontiers were really the work of two Russian emigrants, Golden and Golden Tysa, uh, supplemented by more focused memoranda by another Russian emigrant named Vladimir Simkovich. James T. Shatwell, who supervised the procedure, expressed doubt whether Poland should really be independent at all early in the proceedings. Since Ukraine and Lithuania, they argued, had created governments, no Polish claims to those lands was acceptable according to them. But bizarrely when they later opposed the independence of these states but excuse me, but bizarrely they later opposed the very independence of these states. Golder even argued that really there weren't any Ukrainians at all. Similarly, no part of Eastern Galicia could be rewarded, uh, awarded to Poland, but without a Ukraine, Galicia would automatically go to Russia, with no ethnographic claims to the region at all. In fact, at one point he said Western Galicia should go to Russia. The Golder Golden Vaza Sinkovich trio had come up, come up with a clever scheme to serve Russia and damage Poland. As Shotwell explained, there was no need for concern over Rus Russification or mistreatment of minorities. That was an unfortunate uh, characteristic now consigned to the past. None of this <coughs> excuse me, is surprising. Walter Littman, who prepared the summary for Wilson, uh, hated the Poles and explained their national goals as, and I'm quoting him, simple imperialism. A member of the State Department referred to Lippmann as Wilson's little bronze god. When Lippmann discussed Germans' eastern frontiers, he rejected any attempt to create a barrier to German expansion by supporting an alliance system, including Czechoslovakia or Hungary or Yugoslavia. This was regarded by, Lipp uh, by Lippmann as a very dangerous bit of foolery. Thus, his Europe would have no obstacles to German eastern expansion. How Wilson did not perceive this is quite extraordinary and reflects both his loathing of balance of power considerations and his utter ignorance of the issues posed. Lippmann's colleague Simkovich even once supposed any territory between Germany and Russia being independent whatsoever. Champions of Polish independence were presented, and I'm quoting him, as fools, idiots, fanatics, and ignoramuses. Poland was incapable of independent existence, and the only way to save it was for it to be incorporated into Russia. If this territory were not added to Russia, the result for the world would be catastrophe. <laughs> Poland could not have any territory in historical Lithuania because, and this is my favorite passage in the inquiry, and I'm trying to follow this and hope you do as well, Poland could have no territory in historical Lithuania because, as Golder argued, the Catholics there outnumbered the Poles. Hence, bizarrely, the territory must go to Lithuania. But since there would be no Lithuania, the territory would ultimately go to Russia. This nonsense was considered a model by the inquiry. When calculating Russian territorial questions, the inquiry began by positing that Russia is and will always be, quote, a democratic federal state. Any pre-war autocracy was to be denied in the calculations. Linda Killen has argued that this reflected Wilson's conclusion that the Russians were really, again I'm quoting, a mass of democratic people historically repressed and now awaiting their salvation. A moment, certainly fleeting, had arisen when the building Russian danger to European security could at least have been lessened if Wilson logically applied his own principles. Instead, he adopted a complete opposite view and asked the world to help him reconstruct the Russian Empire. Uh, the report certainly affected the State Department. Secretary Lansing vehemently opposed any territorial losses for Russia at all. He argued that the idea of a post-war Russia might be a threat to, the, to its neighbors was simply groundless. 
He even flirted with Russian dominated, a Russian dominated pan Slavism being reinstituted as a possible barrier to German aggression. Of course, Russian aggression seems never to have occurred to him. The British even suspected what, that what Wilson's preferred defense of Russian territory might cause is that he would suggest that the United States be the guarantor of Russian territory. Wilson's vision of Poland becomes more disturbing when we realize that he is also oblivious to the threat of Germany to Poland and to Europe as a whole. First, he insisted, and again I'm quoting Wilson, there must be no end to German greatness. The country should not be subject to any injury. Nothing should be done to block in any way her legitimate influence or power. There will be no subsequent territory, sub, uh, substantial territorial diminution of Germany. Polish claims to Danzig or Upper Silesia were not endorsed. Arguments to the contrary were rejected out of hand. In other words, the large pre-war role of Berlin should not be fundamentally reduced. Wilson had absolutely no geostrategic vision for the east of Europe. Uh, he admittedly knew virtually nothing about the area and had no real, interest, no real interest in it whatsoever. The east of Europe does not occupy his mental map of Europe. Wilson, therefore, did not understand this area is vital for European security. In fine, Wilson wanted to create a new Europe without changing anything fundamental to the pre-1914 map. In, uh, in near conclusion, I offer what may be a controversial interpretation of how Wilson's Polish policy demonstrates the true, though unconscious, guidelines of his musings. Wilson did not want to construct Europe along any new lines whatsoever. He wanted to retain as much of 19th century Europe as possible. He was a geopolitical conservative. Uh, none of the traditional great powers of, of Europe uh, were to be affected. Why does France regain Alsace-Lorraine without an evaluation of the indisputable nature of the local population? Why should the great menace of the East Russia emerge intact and other claims of the territory be ignored? Why does Germany lose very little and its claim to power is endorsed? The only changes to the structure of Europe are a handful of insignificant East European states, Czechoslovakia, rickety, a rickety Yugoslavia, pathetic Austria, and a much diminished Hungary. Only a large Poland would have been a serious challenge to traditional Europe, and Wilson opposed the idea. The result was an architectural failure. No pillars supported the East. Nothing restrained Russia in the East, uh, nor Germany in the center. Wilson's self-congratulatory pronouncements are really what Pilsudski called American palavering. Wilson worked hard to prevent change in Europe, and he succeeded. Only a fundamental, re fundamental reconstruction of the geopolitics of Europe, a revolution, could have saved Europe. Admittedly, Wilson had no ability to turn French or British politics, for example, and his capacities to work major changes was really small. Well, Wilson thought he was remaking the world. For Poland and the East of Europe in general, basic things were required that Wilson did not possess. He did not know, as said before, the history, geography, and ethnography of the area. More important, he simply didn't care about them. He did not support even grasp an idea such as the reconstruction of an Eastern Federation constructed around Poland. It is eloquent that Wilson once dismissed Pol uh, the Poles as, quote, a new nascent nationality, which I think would mean that the Americans are a new pre-nascent nationality. In other words, his claims were not to be given serious consideration. They were unworthy. It is noteworthy that he characterized the 1919-1920 Polish-Russian War as, quote, Polish imperialism and showed absolutely no understanding of what was at stake. Wilson championed the idea of an independent Poland, not a rational program to assure its survival. Wilson needed Pilsudski, and it got Wilson. I should say Europe needed Pilsudski, and it got Wilson. But we do have a geostrategy, a clear vision, based on the knowledge of the history of the region, someone who realized the fundamental changes were needed. The center of Pilsudski's geopolitical vision seems little more than a megalomaniacal Polish nonsense. When Pilsudski observed Poland is doomed to greatness, it is a grave geopolitical conclusion, not braggadocio. This requires an analysis of the balance of power, but Wilson specifically announced that the calculation was forever discredited. Thus, for Pilsudski, a huge Russian empire in the East will be a geopolitical disaster for Europe. Its ethnic minorities must be liberated. Having done that, an alliance system must be created among them. If not a revised version of the Polish Commonwealth, then a system of alliances built along the, for the same mission. When it, existed, when it existed, Russia played a little, ro little role in European affairs. Soon after it was destroyed, the Russian troops in Paris. The first goal is to make this impossible again, the exact opposite of Wilson. 
Indeed, in his five particular speech, Wilson forbids any alliances not under league uh, auspices, a disastrous stipulation irreconcilable with the Pilsudski vision. But a virtual question, uh, but a vital question virtually always omitted is this. Did Pilsudski intend to create a Polish Empire ruled from Warsaw? He passionately tried to convince Poland's neighbors of the need for alliance, not ingestion into an imperial Poland. In mid-1919, Polish forces drove the Russians out of both Vilno, then, uh, Vilno and Minsk. His first act was to present a speech in both cities with the following passage, quote, Gentlemen, in the near future, you will be called upon to take affairs into your own hands. You will be able to decide for yourself the fate of your country. For the first time in the history of this land, every man will be able to express himself freely. Where in the Wilsonian principles do we read of celebrating self-rule for Lithuania, Ukraine, or Belarus? Nowhere. As regards Lithuania specifically, in 1941, <laughs> the Poles offered the Lithuanians full sovereignty, control of Vilno, whereas the Lithuanian population was small, and he asked only for an alliance. Even the League called the settlement necessary uh, that no ethnographic frontier was possible and that it benefited Lithuanians more than it did Poles. As more than one observer noted, it would have been the crucial step in creating a Baltic plot, the plot, block stretching as far north as Finland. Most important, it would have uh, solved the Belarusian question by arranging it between Poland and Lithuania. Pilsudski was willing to surrender everything for this, even his hometown. Uh, he saw how this would strategically reconfigure a substantial portion of Europe on the basis of alliances and perhaps indeed federation. It would have re reconstructed a quasi-commonwealth, one of the main historic pillars of the architecture of Europe. Wilson, by comparison, never expressed support for self-determination within the borderlands of Imperial Russia. Polish-Ukrainian relations had been very strained for years before the war. Pilsudski knew that reconciliation was essential to the very existence of both lands. He spent years courting the Ukrainians. Pilsudski proposed, quote, the right of Ukrainians to independent political existence is necessary. The right of self-determination is theirs. They were to be sure territorial disputes uh, between the bitter in the case of Galicia, but what choices did either have? It was either Poland or Soviet Russia. Eventually, a brief and fragile silence ensued. The Americans bizarrely opposed Polish-Ukrainian cooperation, almost certainly due to their pro-Russian sentiments. In 1920, the Poles and their Ukrainian allies captured Kiev for the Russians. In a public address, Pilsudski promised that Polish troops would turn, <coughs> excuse me, would turn uh, the government over to the Ukrainians as soon as possible. Pilsudski explained to the French press that Warsaw's control over Ukrainian inhabited territory would, in the long run, be disastrous for Poland. Wilson, bizarrely, never realized that Russian control over the territory would be disaster for the Ukrainians. Taken in sum, what were Pilsudski's plans for the east of Europe? A system of close alliances among several countries which would have recreated a power block gone since the 18th century, perhaps the 17th century. Was this a deception, really disguising his vast plans to create a Polish empire? Mm, I don't think so. I see federalism, or at least an alliance, as his real motive. Wilson, by contrast, opposed all alliances not created and maintained by the League. Pilsudski's dream was anathema to Wilson. In 1920, a vicious war, of, war was fought between Pilsudski's Poles and the Communist Russians. Pilsudski saw it as a turning point in European history. Wilson's reaction was simply dreadful. He referred to the war as fantastically another example of Polish imperialism, as I said before, and seems not to have had any clear idea what was going on. Pilsudski won the war, that was and is certainly a fine bolster for the Poles. But let us disregard this for something yet more important. What if the Poles had lost? An interesting point for speculation. A Russian empire ingesting the borderlands threatened Europe, but Wilson never raised the issue of a possible Ru Russian threat to Europe. Therefore, Pilsudski understood these questions and how fundamental they were for the geopolitical survival of Europe. It is therefore not surprising that the British diplomat Dabrino referred to Pilsudski as the only great man to emerge from World War I. Pilsudski understood what had happened and what was at stake. Wilson did not. Wilson's idealism was little more than self-righteousness supported by disdain for the demands of geopolitics. Poland for Wilson was simply an inco inconsequentiality. As I said, Wilson, uh, Europe needed Pilsudski, but it got Wilson. Thank you very much. Madam President, ladies and excellency, sorry, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very grateful to 
have the opportunity to present a part, some words about a part of Poland which is perhaps a bit neglected in the general presentation of our history of this time. When Poland was, to, was about to reappear on the map of Europe, newly redrafted after the Great War, it seemed, seemed obvious, at least for the Poles, that it the continuity of the existence of the Polish state after the central lasting break. Consequently, the territory was supposed to represent, at least to some, at least to some extent, the former one. It meant pe piecing together the provinces being parts of different empires during the whole long century, a uh, long 19th century, and they were necessarily marked by this fact. Wielkopolska, which is translated generally as Greater Poland, uh, Polonia Major, was one of the lands under the rule of Prussia. Like all others, it had its specificity, resulting from different factors, ma mainly the time and the character of this rule. Wielkopolska is this region here, you have the, the map of Poland well, at this time, then the duty of Warsaw with greater Poland, then here, finally here. And this presence being under Prussian rule compared with other re regions of so-called Prussian Poland was at that. <coughs> As you see, the history was not the same, and we, we concentrate on, on, well, on this, <coughs> this one. Partitions meant for the inhabitants of Polish lands, substituting the former Commonwealth by other and different states. Polish nobles lost they, they, uh, their state, there in the political meaning, not the national one. And in the case of Wielkopolska, Greater Poland, it was difficult to them to find their place in the absolutist and bureaucratic Prussia. Prussian authorities aimed to integrate the newly acquired lands with the rest of the state, whose institutions and activities were much more say, present in everyday life. So, Landowners fell easily into debt and lost their estates. Simultaneously, they had, they had little possibility of finding some perspectives in the civil service because of a double bar barrier, mental and linguistic. Greater Poland was relatively well developed among provinces of Poland, but could hardly compete with others within Prussia. In the Napoleonic era, a strong modernizing push, symbolized by the names of Karl Friedrich Karl von Stein and Karl August von Hardenberg, it was characteristic for Prussia. And in parallel, uh, ties, uh, it this time put end to the bi-ethnic state where 40 uh, with 40% of Polish-speaking population, it was well. well. It was all Russian and Poland. And actually, the other territories, uh, Eastern uh, West Russia, well, Pomerania, Gdańsk, Ermland, uh, and Silesia were present on, on the scheme. <coughs> Uh, most part of uh, of the its Polish part uh, of the Polish part of Prussia and the Duchy of Warsaw, as you've seen, modernized under French line by Polish activists who formed during the reformatory agitation of the in the last years of the Commonwealth. And out of all land that Prussia had lost in that period. The Congress of Vienna gave her back only the Greater Poland. Wielkopolska, perhaps I, I use the Polish name. 
Bearing the name of the Grand Duchy of Poznań, it was granted some autonomy. Polish was accepted as the official language on par with German, and Poles were given, in theory, access to all government offices. Thus, the binational character of the province was admitted, but within the Alan state which, propo which proposed himself to unify all its parts. Nevertheless, it was a different Prussia than a few years ago, thanks th to this ever mentioned thorough modernization. An important uh, element of it was the deep social and economical changes of the country. Thanks to the evolution of feudal duties, the lands in Prussia, so in Greater Poland as in Wielkopolska as well, though with some delay, took the form of landlord estates and farmers freeholds, relatively big and viable economically. It must be added that the former feudal landlord properties in, in Wielkopolska were not uh, as great as those characteristic of eastern territories where there, uh, they were really immense. Thus, the nature of the Prussian challenge was economic, and Polish gentry had to be efficient. The emblematic person of this form of activity became Desideri Chłapowski, former officer of Napoleon. He stayed for then after he stayed for two years in England in order to study English agricultural practices, which he subsequently introduced to in his estate of Turev. This mark of his new way of doing things was replacing the coat of arms on his residence by the clock, a symbol of discipline, punctuality, and respect for his own and others' time. It was his way of understanding patriotism, although from time to time he made significant breaks, was taking an active part in the Polish uprising in 1830 uh, 31. Then he was organizing troops in his region during the revolt in 1848. The above mentioned uprising of the beginning of the 30s di directed against Russia was helped by the Poles from other provinces and people from Wielkopolska took quite considerable part in it, not only Kłapowski. Then they had to bear the consequences, imprisonment, sequesters, sometimes exile. One of the effects of this uh, so-called November Rising was a spread of sympathy for, for Poles in the liberal and democratic circles in Germany. Signs of Poland and Poland enthusiasm were to be seen in, the <coughs> in Berlin in the revolutionary year uh, 1848. But within a few weeks, it became clear that the German project of national unity was not squaring with Polish aims. And it was an end of, of some period. And until 1918, there was no other attempt of shaking off the Prussian rule by force. This rule became harsher already after 1830. The state policy, realized now by the new Oberpräsident of the province, Edward Clodwell, was to strengthen the German character of the region. The autonomy diminished gradually. In parallel, Poles entered more and more on the way of the civic self-organization modernizing their estates, promoting Polish handicraft and commerce, as well as educative and cultural initiatives. This type of activity was named, the name appeared already this, this morning, organic work. As, say, as says Norman Davies in his History of Poland, God's Playground, I quote here, the Polish movement in Poznania developed marked characteristics. characteristics sorry. It was very state and bourgeois, and in many ways was an avid imitation of German virtues." End of quotation. One of the first manifestations of this movement, of this kind of initiatives, was creating a center of economic and cultural activities founded in 1841 in Poznań, named Bazaar. The emblematic figure of this and a number of other initiatives was Karol Marcinkowski, physician, philanthropist, and organizer, followed by many. By many. On, the, on the right side, you see the actual monument of 
to Martin, of Martin Kowski in Poznań. The strong modernizing, modernizing push combined with the earlier relative development of Greater Poland mapped it very much during the next decades, especially on, in the fields of economy, education and civic self-organization. What was most in important was extending it to large, large strata of society. The history of the region during those decades is marked by a long list of institutions like Central Economic Association, Credit Associations, Agricultural Societies Propagating Modern Farming Methods, the Association of Popular Libraries, Choral and or Gymnastic Societies, and so on and so on. These types of initiatives marked everyday life to the extent unknown in other Polish lands. Once again, a quotation from Norman Davis. It was broadly conversant with similar programs of uh, social modernization all over Europe. What was remarkable, perhaps, was the thoroughness and inflexibility of its application, and in consequence, the payments of the Polish response, end of the quotation. Neither Austria nor Russia could be compared to Germany, to Prussia, in the field of moder modernization. The German thoroughness and inflexibility became especially harsh after uh, 1871, when Bismarck's main aim was to protect German, uh, German unity against anything that could jeopardize it. It was also the time of growth and versatility of modernization, and the Polish national res resistance made full use of its numerous forms. In parallel, there exists some form, existed some form of illegal activity, limited in its range and forms. Circles uh, of youth in the secondary schools organizing their national self-education and self-improvement, eventually continuing among Polish students at German universities. At the beginning of the 20th century, with the for formation of two adverse blocks in Europe and the progressing possibility of conflict, it developed, this kind of activity developed also into physical self-training and military training in the Prussian army, supposed to serve the national cause. So it was really the patriotism who made some people to enter the army to be trained. And the contacts made by this way of this organization were kept later on. On the eve of the World War I, Poles kept their positions, while the Prussian administration did its best to convince them that what ca whatever could happen in the Russian or Austrian part partition, it wouldn't change their situation in the Kingdom of Hohenzollern. And it seemed to be true after the outbreak of the Great War. In those years, things changed greatly in Russian Poland, there was some evolution in Galicia, but the only change that Wielkopolska experienced was the gradual deterioration of life condition, conditions in line with the rest of Germany. Things moved forward at the proper time. On July 1918, a secret central civic committee was set up in Poznań and established soon ties with the Polish National Comite Committee of Dmowski organized in Paris. Immediately after the November Revolution in Germany, the, this civic committee took the steps towards taking the effective power of the province. On the 11th of no November, the German mayor of Pol Poznań was forced to resign and his office was taken by a Pole, Jarogniew Drwenski. It is largely unknown in this, uh, say, <coughs> in this narration, this narrative of, of 1918, for instance. Uh, at the beginning of December, the representatives of all Poles in Germany held in Poznan the assembly called the Provincial Diet, which mandated the Supreme People's Council as the central Polish authority in Germany. And its member tactics were to refrain from fait accompli and to await the decision of the future peace conference 
reminding us of the well-practiced well, way of legalism. Matters took, however, a different form, different turn, with the coming uh, of, of Ignacy Jan Paderewski to Poznań. During World War I, this eminent pianist turned into politician. At the end of December 1918, he left the West and came to his country. On his way from Gdańsk to Warsaw, he visited Poznań in order to demonstrate Polish claims to this region. His arrival provoked huge patriotic, uh, patriotic manifestations that developed into an insurrection on December 27th. And it turned out, out then that the clandestine preparations has been uh, going on as well. They had ties both the for with the former activities we've uh, mentioned above, and with the action of Piłsudski's Polish military organization, POW. Within a few days, the insurgents became a regular army. Uh, okay. That eliminated German rule almost in the whole province. This military success turned, out, uh, turned at the diplomatic one when the region was included into, into the ceasefire agreement between the Entente and Germany, prolonged on February, uh, 16, 16th February 1919 in trial. This prevented a possible German counteroffensive. The Wielkopolska uprising is considered as the only successful one, as you have mentioned, <laughs> and Polish. Well, when presenting Polish history in the 19th century as a whole, there is little emphasis on what was going on in Wielkopolsk, and it is understandable. On one hand, it had neither, uh, the region was neither the center of the ancient Commonwealth, nor the center of Polish action during the partitions. <coughs> what was happening in Poznania had its local meaning, not, but not a Polish-wide scale. It was true even for, the, uh, for only for this only successful uprising, because it was not aimed at reinventing <coughs> the Polish state, it was already in existence when the fights began. On the other hand, among all the parts of what could be named Prussian Poland, Wielkopolska was, was the only one where, where the Polish presence was dominant and could stand, stand up to the su supremacy of the Prussian rule. And the character of this confrontation was determined by the features of the strong and modern Prussian, Prussian, shape, uh, Prussian state, sorry, and it shaped the mentality of the Polish population. The legal way has to be respected, and the main form of competing was economic efficiency and civil self-organization. Given the sharpness of the national confrontation, there were no place left for class or politi political conflicts within the Polish society. This conviction shaped the ideology of the current named national democracy, which became the dominant one in Wielkopolska. Another moment to be stressed is that this confrontation involved only two antagonist sides. There was no other there were no other nationalities. There were no national claims that could oppose, oppose faults to somebody else or to be maneuvered by the Prussian administrations against them. It was unlike in other Polish lands. And the national split between Poles and Germans went together with the conventional one, which strengthened the above-mentioned solidarity. So the path to independence for Great Poland adds its peculiar features. If have, have also forged a specific mentality of the inhabitants compared with other Prussian lands. The Prussian rule was so powerful that it seemed hardly realistic to hope for this abolishment. But when the opportunity appeared, Poznania inhabitants proved to be prepared for independence. Thank you.
the way. Made some mess here. successful and uh, well it was a really difficult, uh, difficult time for, for Germany it was the revolution was was on but within some weeks they organized themselves at, uh, at this mid February they were ready already to the, uh, they were ready to to the counter offensive and that's why this trial uh, armistice war was so, so important, because it was the prolongement of this armistice with Entente, but in this moment it was also adap adapted to, to, to Poznania, to, to Wielkopolska, which protected Poles against this German counter offensive, because it would, uh, it would mean breaking the truce with Entente. between the efforts of the Poles themselves and the uh, decisions made by the victorious Allied powers. Uh, is there, a, this particularly goes to Professor Biskupski, but it could also go to Professor Polanski or to Professor Schramm. Um, is there not an assumption sometimes by his, uh, scholars of international relations that the sort of the big three basically fixed everything between themselves and the smaller powers had their frontiers fixed for them. Was it not the case in the, the end and in the aftermath of the First World War, that it was not just in the case of Greater Poland, but in many other places, that the situation on the ground was already creating fair accompli, uh, and that it was impossible simply for uh, the great powers to impose their will? My answer is first and short. Uh, there's, there's considerably merit in what you say, but the examples are, are, are rather different. Let's take the case of Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia really created itself. Uh, the case of Hungary, um, rather complicated. One has to consider such, such nuisances as invasion. Uh, in the case of Poland, uh, I would agree that the situation in Poland, other than the eastern frontiers, was largely set before the uh, uh, before there was, well, no, the, I, I'm, now that I'm thinking and contradicting myself makes me a lot more comfortable to question. Uh, the question of Upper Silesia and the Poznanian border was set in large measure because of the Allies. Those mm -hmm. set by the Poles, I think, the, are the eastern frontier, the region frontier. So it, it varies from country to country, period to period. I think when one looks at the conflict in Eastern Europe, and in particular the Polish lands, you have to remember that the war lasts till 1921 for the Treaty of Riga, mm -hmm. and uh, the mm -hmm. conflict is very complicated. There are a lot of issues which uh, Professor Biskupski raised. Um, could the Polish-Soviet war have been avoided? Was there a chance for negotiation, as Piotr Vandich argues in the mm -hmm. Polish-Soviet uh, relations? 
uh, because clearly the problem with the Polish Soviet war was that Poland lacked the resources to carry this policy out successfully. Piłsudski said we are condemned to greatness, but <laughs> the tra trouble was that this uh, was in a situation where um, <coughs> there was no unified support for this war, and in addition, in the last analysis, the taking of Kiev mobilized Russian national sentiment, which the Bolsheviks were able to mobilize with great success. Polish, uh, the Polish taking of Kiev did not result in the establishment of a viable Ukrainian state. Mm -hmm. uh, on the contrary, it resulted in uh, the emergence of a powerful Soviet force, which uh, could well have won the Battle of Warsaw. I mean, mm -hmm. this could have gone mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. way. I mean, I think that if one looks at it from today's perspective, we are seeing uh, processes which need to be looked at in a longer perspective mm -hmm. uh, and which go against the ideas which Pilsudski would have liked to implement. I think that he was sincere in that he wanted to have relations of more or less equal character between Poland and the countries which would be part of this federation, particularly uh, mm -hmm. Lithuania and Ukraine. The problem was that in Lithuania, the way in which the national movement had developed took an essentially anti-Polish direction. Necessary. Uh, and in Ukraine, the issue was not so much national independence, but land hunger and mm -hmm. uh, the desire of peasants for land. Uh, in the case it, of Lithuania, it, it this against worked Poles. against the Poles. And in the case of uh, Ukraine, it, it did too. This worked against the Ukrainian government. Uh, in the longer term, we see the emergence of national states in this area as part of a process which has which is being completed now. Mm -hmm. uh, we see now, for the first time, an autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church. This is uh, something which nobody achieved before. Uh, and uh, the establishment of a clearly based Lithuanian national identity. Whether the uh, Belarusian national identity has even today uh, emerged is, is another uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the problem really for, for Pilsudski was, one, there was a lack of support within these countries for what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the local Polish population was not that sympathetic towards what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Vilna is a good case. Mm -hmm. um, Pilsudski was very eager to give Vilna to the Lithuanians, but the local Poles mm -hmm. were extremely hostile to this. And uh, whether how much Pilsudski, how much control Pilsudski had over events on the ground uh, would well be uh, disputed here. Mm -hmm. And the whole uh, creation of Litva Shrodkova mm -hmm. undermined everything that Pilsudski mm -hmm. was uh, trying mm -hmm. to do. The one thing that the Lithuanians could not tolerate was the loss of Vilna stroke Vilnius. Yes. Uh, one could spend more time on this. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think that from the longer term point of view, the Polish victory in the Polish Soviet war did give Europe, uh, Poland and Europe 20 years of peace. But in the long run, it probably saved up a great deal of trouble because it led to a situation where the Pol Soviets were never going to accept an independent Polish state mm -hmm. and where Germany saw uh, uh, accommodation with the Soviet Union as one way of returning to, great, to greatness and we, we see this happening in 39. I think we need to link these two wars together. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> actually, if you allow me, mm, with, with these comments on the uh, on the Polish-Soviet war and all the po possible issues of it, and all the consequences of it, we enter into counterfactual history. Neither be, neither be. Uh, but uh, it is a bit uh, different. Uh, it is another aspect of the situation because what we are discussing at this moment is the situation of the turn of 1819. Yes. Uh, when the Polish-Soviet war was one of problems among, among other conflicts that uh, Poland has uh, to face in this moment, and perhaps not, not the most urgent one, uh, just one point, but uh, in general uh, uh, your question is perfectly, you're perfectly right, and Piłsudski was uh, aware uh, himself uh, very soon on it, that uh, on the west side we depend entirely on allies, and we will have what, what will be given by, uh, by the allies, and we ourselves, we have to occupy us with the East, East Front. So. If, if I may, uh, I agree substantially with Professor Polanski. I always do, but uh, two, two small points, perhaps. One is, I think the value of uh, ethnographic states is, uh, is perhaps exaggerated. Yeah. 
by creating ethnographic states and, and uh, population movements about in, in Europe, you create a series of, uh, of very brittle little pieces uh, and how, how that's going to be in the long-term interest of, uh, of Europe, I don't know, unless you have a third Europe or something or other like that. Uh, so that's that, that's uh, that's troublesome. And you made a remark about Russia wasn't satisfied with the Riga frontier. Well, what frontier would Russia have been satisfied with? And my answer would be 1945 would do nicely, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't see I don't see who's interested that in other than sounds. This is a very important question. I'm sorry that Professor Novak isn't here because the question is, mm -hmm. what were the Soviets? So it was Soviet Russia mm -hmm. because the Bolshevik the Soviet Union wasn't yet right. created. What was Soviet Russia looking for in 1919? They were looking, I mean, one can argue, there are two ways of arguing about this. One is they believed that the revolution would not survive in Soviet Russia and in the, Soviet Russia. In the former mm -hmm. Russian territory mm -hmm. unless there was a world revolution. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the best place to have a world revolution starting was Germany. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, uh, the only way you can get to Germany to assist a revolution is over Poland. Uh, and in this sense, the war is probably inevitable. That's yes. one point of view. The other is that Lenin was realistic, and so was Trotsky. And the Red Army had won the Civil War, but only just. And the prospect of Allied intervention in support of the whites still existed. Uh, indeed, one might point out here that one of the reasons for the weakness of the Treaty of Versailles was the original Western uh, strategic concept, mm -hmm. which was not related to Wilson's but to the mm -hmm. British and French, was that the punitive peace on Germany, insofar as it was that, mm -hmm. it wasn't that punitive, but the peace that was going to be imposed on Germany would be maintained by the British, the French, and the Russians. And mm -hmm. this is why Russia was so important. But that's a different point. But mm -hmm. the, 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 the Soviet Russia was looking for accommodation with the countries to the west. Mm -hmm. They made an accommodation with Finland, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they made an accommodation with Romania. The talks at Mikasha, uh, they were into counterfactual history. Here, but <laughs> yeah. The talks no. that took place at Mikashevici uh, could have led to an agreement. It was Pilsudski who broke off these talks, not the Russians. Um, <laughs> well, uh, you can argue about that, <laughs> but, but that's how it looks. Yes. Uh, and. and uh, maybe this wouldn't have proved lasting, but this comes back to the question of frontier. Uh, as mm -hmm. the French say, rien ne dure que la uh, uh, An agreement then, like the Polish, uh, like mm -hmm. the Soviet Finnish agreement, might have lasted longer. This was, mm -hmm. when, um, this was an inherently unstable situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, actually, th those issues should be discussed with Professor Novak <laughs> and <laughs> the, <laughs> definitely. So perhaps a, a bit uh, later, later on. But uh, on his opinion. Uh, neither from both si sides uh, wanted yeah, peace right, already, yes. because their aims yeah. were different yeah. what, from what could this peace agreement give. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. There was somebody at the back who wanted to ask yeah. it. That's a good question. Uh, the degree to which, <laughs> the degree to which Wilson was ignored by all European powers is problematical because I think the striking thing about Wilson's uh, influence in Europe, not so much policy influence, but shall we say, uh, the the moral light he cast upon Europe, has a very interesting uh, uh, line of uh, uh, movement. At first, when he arrived in Europe in uh, 1919, everyone thought he was Jesus. Uh, not long thereafter, uh, they lost their faith. Uh, so, so I think uh, within a relatively short period of time, once the Americans decided not to ratis uh, ratify the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the American influence in Europe, also because the Americans didn't want to have any influence in Europe, because then they'd have to undertake responsibility, uh, I think that quickly waned. Okay, well, I think maybe we should stop there. Oh, no, maybe we've got time, sorry, you need five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether I have heard Professor Polovsky correctly 
Uh, he seems to have said that it was Russia which couldn't tolerate the racism of Poland, German, or Bobs. My feeling is that uh, for Soviet policy throughout the interwar period, there were changes, but the existence of the Polish state within the 1921 frontiers was regarded as unacceptable. Uh, and in this sense, uh, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact followed logically from mm -hmm. earlier Soviet policy. And in this sense, the Soviets did think. <coughs> Poland as a saison start. Mm -hmm. you could, mm -hmm. This is uh, complicated because we're talking about 20 years, and over those 20 <coughs> years, policy changes. There was a brief period when the Soviets toyed with the idea of collective security, and when they also reached a non-aggression agreement with the Poles. Uh, how seriously they took this uh, collective uh, security, one might well ar argue, but certainly the Western capitulation to the Germans over Czechoslovakia convinced the Soviets that mm -hmm. the West could not be trusted. And if you look at the negotiations in 1939, when the uh, British had given a guarantee to Poland, but the uh, guarantee required, I mean, for it to make sense, there had to be Soviet neutrality in any Polish German war. And um, if you look at the Soviet side in these negotiations, what the Soviets were above all concerned with is what would happen when the Germans invaded Poland and the, uh, and the West, the, the British didn't do anything and they found themselves on the eastern border of Poland, mm -hmm. would they stop there? Mm -hmm. uh, and they took the view that they wouldn't and this I think mm -hmm. is what led to the Nazi-Soviet pact. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think that um, essentially if, if we look at this, the, the, the question is under what kind of how viable was Polish independence in the interwar years? Mm -hmm. uh, could uh, Polish independence have been defended? Was mm -hmm. the loss of independence in 1939 something which followed inevitably from 1918? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, things could have gone differently. Uh, but the we Western, the, Amer the American withdrawal from Europe, and the yes. British and American, British and French belief that their security could be guaranteed in the West and not in the East, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. probably undermined the viability of the Polish state. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'd like to ask a follow-up, which is uh, against uh, appearance, <coughs> quite strongly related to the yeah. I think that the unsung hero of uh, these years is Maxim Litvino. I just wonder, hasn't he, given, hasn't he been given enough chance? to uh, carry out his uh, uh, concept of the uh, anti-German coalition, to which unfortunately Poland has contributed twice. Yeah, well, there were counter voices within the Soviet administration, and Litvinov is the best example. Uh, the question is, at what point did the Soviet, or Stalin, because Stalin is the key figure here, at what point did Stalin's commitment to collective security and to an anti-German position uh, wane. Um, I agree with you, Litvinov is a hero, and his autobiography, you know, the, his memoirs show that he was committed <coughs> to this uh, anti-German position, but it was a minority position, and ultimately he couldn't, he couldn't <coughs> carry it out. Um, but, uh, and as you say, uh, I don't think it was appreciated within Beck's uh, administration uh, that this was an alternative to whatever Beck was doing, which was an accommodation without an alliance with Nazi Germany, um, mm -hmm. which uh, there's going to be a paper. I don't see Anita Prasnowska. So uh, the, 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 this is related to the Polish-Czech relationship, so, uh, which obviously you'll be talking about. <laughs> One very last quick question. Yes, uh, is it slide? Yes, good, thank you. <coughs> I'll be very quick. Uh, this is a longer question, which I'm putting out to a, a short one for uh, Professor, Professor Kolansky. Um, you made a comment, which I didn't draw context for when you were speaking, and the quote was, Jews were seen as an internal enemy. My question was, if you can recall the specific comment you made, by whom? Because in some time, there were the uh, aggressors who were in KDB, and they were seen as, previous aggressor, 
yes, yes, I was, <coughs> I was talking there about the emergence of integral nationalism, which in the Polish context means the, na <coughs> excuse me, the National Democrats and Domowski. And I think that it's clear, Ioana uh, um, Mitlitz has written a book on this, uh, that for the National Democrats, the, the Jews became, it took a certain time, amount of time, <coughs> The National Democrats originally were more anti-German and pro-Russian than anti-Jewish, but after the Bolshevik, after the revolution of 1905, the idea that the Jews are behind this revolution and that the Jews threaten the interests of Poland and that the Jews have prevented the emergence of the Polish middle class, these were basic tropes of Demowski's thinking, and uh, it was in this context that the Jews were the national enemy. This was not a universally held view. There was strong opposition to it, uh, obviously, Jews looked to the Pilsudski camp as a group which supported them, and by and large, the, the Pilsudski camp opposed anti Semitism. Pilsudski was certainly an anti anti Semite. He saw anti Semitism as something which was used by his enemies. But it's in that context that I was referring to. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again for a wonderful discussion, very, very interesting papers, and I think we all need to copy that. So. <laughs>